Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 19th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our take on the impact on Alaska of Conoco's acquisition of Concho Resources. We've seen this movie before. Second, our view of what's important in the Alaska legislative races with two weeks remaining before election. Third, it's important to understand that a big part of the fiscal clash next session will be between the state and local governments. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Concho. Uh, I mean, what is it? Where is it? And why is Conoco's acquisition of it potentially bad news for the state of Alaska? So Concho is a major uh, 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 shale driller focused in the Permian Basin in West Texas. Major, uh, a major player down in in, in West Texas. And Conoco announced yesterday uh, its acquisition, a stock acquisition, um, of Concho, uh, which is good for both companies. I mean, Concho has been focused on shale. Shale goes up and down. Uh, there's some stability to Conoco. Conoco has been uh, a big player in two of the shale basins, Eagleford in Texas and Bakken up in uh, up in the Dakotas, uh, has been try has been a player in uh, in the Permian, but a relatively small player. Uh, Permian is probably going to be the biggest turnout. It is turning out to be the biggest of the shale basins. Um, and this leaps Conoco from about 100,000 barrels a day uh, out of the Permian to, combined with Concho, about 400,000 barrels a day. So it quadruples uh, the size of, of Conoco uh, down, in the, down in the Permian. Um, there's, Concho has nothing in Alaska. Uh, and so it's not in, immediately obvious that this has an impact uh, on Alaska, but it does. Um, we've seen this movie before. Uh, in, uh, in 2018, BP acquired BHP, uh, BHP's properties uh, uh, in, uh, in the lower 48, which were predominantly shale properties. That acquisition was about $10 billion, if I recall correctly, in 2018. The Conoco acquisition of Concho is about $9 billion, roughly comparable in terms of, uh, in terms of scale. And, and the consequence of BP's BHP acquisition was it really refocused BP's oil uh, attention, if you will, uh, and, and with attention comes dollars, investment dollars, refocused uh, uh, B, uh, BP's uh, attention in that way to the lower 48 and to shale, uh, and really reformed uh, BP's outlook and BP's uh, 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 attentions uh, toward that part of its uh, that part of its portfolio. I mean, you spend 10 billion dollars. That's that's going to happen. That's where you that's where you're you're putting your money and putting your attention. Um, I, Conoco's acquisition of Concho is going to do much the same thing. It's going to refocus. It is refocusing uh, Conoco's attention uh, much more on the lower 48, much more on shale. Uh, than it than it has been before. There's there was a second thing that happened yesterday that really truly unless you're unless you're really a deep dive oil person truly went under the radar, and that is uh, in the same call that uh, Ryan Lance, the CEO of Conoco, announced uh, the Con- the Concho acquisition. Ryan also announced that Conoco was adopting uh, the uh, uh, 
the the net zero pledge, uh, net zero carbon emissions uh, a pledge that a lot of the European oil companies uh, have uh, have taken. None of the uh, none of the U.S. oil U.S. based oil companies had then, done that up until yesterday. Uh, when Ryan announced that Conoco was doing that, he announced that uh, Conoco is going to uh, 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 adopt a pledge to go to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The combination of those two things, refocusing uh, their their exploration or their 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 investment budget on on shale, particularly in the Permian, and the announcement that they're going to um, uh, going to go to uh, adopt the net zero emissions uh, policy. Led uh, it led one analyst uh, that uh, uh, that I think uh, has a, a lot of insight uh, to say this: once the takeover is consummated, Conoco will restrict drilling capital to projects that will turn a profit, even if crude is trading for less than forty dollars a barrel. That probably will obviate, in other words, eliminate some parts of the company's existing portfolio, such as fields in Alaska and the oil sands of Western Canada. And it's and it's sort of it's it, as I said we've seen this movie before with BP's acquisition of BHP. Once you once you have once we once you make a major play like that a major investment like that that's where your focus goes that's where that's where Wall Street's focus goes. Wall Street says okay you invested nine billion dollars uh, in making in making this acquisition show us what you're going to be able to do with this show show us show us show us the money that you're gonna that you're gonna generate out of this. And that's where your focus goes. That's where your investment goes. That's where your that's where your activity goes. I, Conoco's not leaving Alaska tomorrow. Certainly, uh, they're not uh, going to you know shut down investment in activities. Indeed, in the conference call yesterday, uh, uh, Ryan talked about uh, the continued activity at, at Willow, which is which is something that Conoco's made. Uh, a big deal out of with the uh, with the investment community right. in the recent past, and and Ryan uh, and Matt Fox, the the, CE, the COO, essentially uh, uh, made a recommitment to uh, to the Willow. Development. But 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 we're going to see a diversion of Conoco's attention. We're going to see a diversion of Conoco's investment capital uh, or fight. And I think the the yesterday who who made the observation that. Quote, that probably will obviate some parts of the company's portfolio as fields in Alaska and the oil sands of Western Canada. I think that I think that's an observation. And, and it's something that, that Alaska needs to take into account. If we're going to have less focus from uh, from Conoco, if we're going to have less uh, uh, investment uh, uh, from Conoco going forward, I, I think that I think that affects it should affect people's thinking about Prop One and it should affect uh, people's thinking about uh, about other issues. So it's a um, it, it's a j- as I say, we've seen this movie before. We've seen BP BHP in in, in 2018, and we and we see where that led. Um, it's not. I, I never could find an article on BP BHP in uh, uh, in the Alaska in the Alaska press at the time that the transaction happened, or or in the in in the in the days or in the weeks months following. Uh, but it had a big impact on Alaska, and uh, and I think this one uh, is, is going to as well. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable uh, Budgets, uh, talking about acquisitions and where does it go. So break it down for us. I mean, it, it basically means that with uh, the net zero approach and everything else, their focus will just change. And so that means that we could expect a decline regardless of what else is going on in the state. I mean, everything adds to it, don't get me wrong, but – they're, you know, they're looking at, at bigger fish to fry. Is that kind of what the, the the long and the short of it is? Yeah, it, 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 they're looking at bigger fish to fry, and they're looking at a new toy. I mean, it's like you, you, it's like your kid. You know, you give them a new toy, they're focused on the new toy. You, they still have the old toy; they didn't throw it out, uh, but but they no longer give it the care and attention uh, that that it had before. And at some point, you know, it gets broken uh, along the way. Wall Street, I mean, they've uh, Conoco rightfully. I mean, nine billion dollars is a lot of money. Conoco rightfully has uh, has uh, uh, made a huge bet now, a huge investment uh, on the shale play, particularly in the Permian. Wall Street is going to be focused on on what Conoco does with that, um, and Conoco is going to be focused on what it does with that because it wants to deal with Wall Street. And as I say, 
the, the thing that really went under the radar is this is this commitment on net carbon. Uh, but but that's a that's a big commitment also, and and, and shareholders and Wall Street and others will be looking at at what uh, Conoco does with that. And for good or bad, I I, I think it's wrong personally. But for for good or bad, uh, investments in Alaska are viewed as 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 not carbon zero. Uh, they're viewed as adding to uh, the the climate change uh, situation as opposed to subtracting from. So. You know, with that commitment, people are going to be evaluating Conoco on whether it's living up to its its net carbon commitment and or net zero carbon commitment, and they're going to be, you know, evaluating investments in Alaska as uh, as uh, against that standard as well. I, I just there, I think the, the analysts that are that have said sort of in passing because everybody's focus is on what this means for Conoco in terms of cash flow and in terms of valuation. Uh, Sort of in passing, but I think those analysts that have picked up uh, the knock-on impact on on Alaska and and as this analyst said, the oil sands of Western Canada, uh, I think those analysts uh, have 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 good insight. And as I said, you know, we've seen this movie before in Alaska with BP BHP, uh, and I think it's a, I, I, I think it's something we need to take into account that that we're no longer the shiny object, we're no longer the new toy, we're no longer the the uh, uh, the the focus of, uh, of of mom and dad's eye has gone on to the uh, gone on to the next thing and and um, and that has consequences. Does that open up the door for smaller players to come in? I mean, I think that's one of the bigger questions that many people ask is, you know, the bigs when the bigs don't want to play with you anymore, do the smaller ones come in? Because some of these were small to begin with and became big in in part by working in Alaska. So does this open that opportunity or is it? I mean, are we in danger zone, or is it an opportunity for smaller players to become larger players? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, Conoco's already announced last year uh, that it's looking to sell a quarter, twenty five percent of its interest uh, in the in the western no- North Slope. So it, that sort of opened the door to a smaller player in any event. The the, the challenge with smaller players uh, is finding financing. Uh, in in this environment, finding financing not only in the sense of, of forty dollar oil. How do you how do you justify uh, investment in forty dollar oil? Uh, but also from you know the the, the global warming, the, the climate challenge. Uh, banks are. I mean, we we've, we've seen it. We've talked about it on the show. Um, uh, banks are increasingly looking at from a business standpoint are looking at uh, climate challenges. They they don't want to be they don't want to be tied up in investments. Uh, that uh, that are going to have are, are going to be additive to the to the perceived to be additive to the climate challenge because they're not great credit risks. Uh, they may be the first to shut down. They may be the first to have to pay higher taxes. They may be the first that that have uh, huge regulations imposed on them. So they're 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 challenged credit risk. So yes, maybe it opens the door. I mean, as I say, Conoco's had this twenty five percent. Uh, of its Western North Slope operations up on up on the auction block, yes, maybe uh, it, it brings in smaller players, but smaller players have got to find the financing. Oil search with the uh, with the Pika development, I that's at forty. If we stay around forty dollars, forty forty five dollars, that's going to be a very challenged project. Not to mention uh, the 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 climate issues that go, that uh, the banks are looking at that go on top of that. So it's um. Maybe it opens up for smaller players, but that's not necess- that's not a great thing uh, because uh, then we have to deal with the financing issues. So transnationals have no loyalty to any sovereign nation or state, says Robbie, and Willie says certainly not by changing the tax structure like underwear <laughs> is the thing. Uh, but you and I have talked about that. I mean, there is still some money on the table, and we could create. I mean, if you were king for a day, could you create a tax structure that – made sense for the state and for the oil companies that would that something that could be in place for you know for years without really being uh, 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 you know affixed I mean I agree in one part that we've got money on the table but we we definitely have to find something where people keep saying no more for me no more for you no more for me no more for you the, the problem the problem with that the challenge with that Michael is that is that other things change I mean you base you base the tax structure on what you on what you project, what you think, what you know uh, at the time. Uh, when we did uh, uh, SB 21, 
uh, in uh, in 2013, 2014, uh, you had you had a you, you you had a sense of where oil prices were, where they were likely going to go, um, and you had a sense of what the federal government was doing in terms of the uh, uh, federal uh, corporate income tax rate, uh, and you sort of you know you know you based your tax rate on that. Well, you know oil prices went in a different direction than where they were anticipated. Uh, in 2017, the feds have dramatically changed the corporate income tax rate, which has reduced the federal share uh, and opened up room for, uh, for a, a, you know, a question about whether the state should take some of that or the, or the, or the companies should have it all. Uh, and it's just, I mean, things change. And, and the, way we're, the way we do taxes, which is against the standard that you uh, outlined on the last program, which is maximum benefit for the people, uh, the way we do taxes, you, you you need to stay alert and change with it. I mean, it's just basically the, the basically the look is, look, Alaska is going to take all that it can under the Constitution. Alaska takes all that it can, uh, short of, uh, of of doing itself uh, near and long term harm. Bill says this is wonderful, Brad. Such a change of the normal bad news delivery. Can't wait for number two and number three. It's like Brad comes on and the beatings will continue until morale improves. That's kind of what's going on. I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's like you're that dose of reality that nobody wants to take every week. It's like that bitter pill that nobody wants to take, but they got to do it to stay alive. Yeah. How, how, how do you how do you change if you don't know where you're headed? I mean, right. this this is the same problem that Scott and I ran into in the in the 20 teens. I mean, we talked about sustainable budgets. We talked about the need for sustainable. We talked about the need for reducing spending, uh, and people said, "Bad news! I don't want to hear it. We're going to keep on. Spending. We're going to use, and we're going to use savings." So look, we're in that left left us. So how do you how do you change course? Uh, how do you how do you moderate your behavior? How do you respond to where you're headed if you don't know where you're headed? Yeah, uh, you know, I yeah, it's not. I'd love to say that. Oh my God, the acquisition of Concho just you know makes Alaska so much better. It doesn't. It makes and you need to understand that as we as we make decisions going forward. You really you've got to understand what the obstacles are in front of you. You've got to understand what the issues are in front of you uh, uh, in order to make good choices. We did not make good choices back in 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 the in the early twenty teens uh, in terms of spending. We did not make good choices in terms of in terms of using up our savings. Um, and we didn't because because people kept looking at oil prices are going to recover, production is going to come save the day. There's, there was going to be various cavalries that came over the hill uh, and bailed us out. None of them came over the hill. None of them are coming over the hill. We need to we need to be realists about what we're facing uh, as we as we address these issues. Or we're gonna or we're gonna go through the same thing that we went through in in the 20 teens instead of spending out. Uh, the CBR, the SBR, though, we're going to spend out the ERA, and then where the heck are we going to be? Right. Then, then what have we left uh, uh, future generations? So it, we just need to confront these things. We need, to, we need to see them, understand them, and confront them, as opposed to say, oh, no, that's just Debbie Downer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to believe something else. Oh, I just, We just need to, be re- we need to be realists. Yeah, I don't think that that's what he meant, but I just think that, you know, that, that is, sometimes it is. It's sometimes I feel like it's one too many hits with the snake. You know, we come in here and... We get battered around, and we got to have Chris Story to uplift us afterwards because, damn, it it gets grim out there. But if nobody's willing to speak the truth, how can you can't speak power if you can't speak the truth? And that's the problem: is that many of these politicians just want to ignore it and pretend like it's not even there. Let's give a tease for number two, Brad. We're going to talk a little bit about the remaining two weeks in the races and what's. I mean, if nobody, if you haven't decided as of now, I don't know. You haven't been paying attention, apparently, but uh, give us a taste here of what's coming in the remaining two weeks. Well, I think I think we're we're the, the remaining two weeks in this election are going to decide uh, really where Alaska goes going forward uh, in terms of its uh, in terms of its fiscal policy. There was a lot of uh, uh, euphoria, a lot of uh, excitement around the upsets that occurred uh, in the primary. Uh, but now we're to the general, uh, and, uh, and, and I, it's not clear uh, that uh, fiscal conservatives are going to prevail uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, holding the legislature. James Brooks has an excellent article uh, in the ADN uh, over the weekend 
uh, talking about uh, he's, the headline is the 14 races could decide who controls the Alaska legislature for the next two years, and I and there's a lot of a lot of uncertainty around where some of these races go. So we're going to talk about those, and we're going to talk about how that affects the legislature going forward. Uh, we're back with Brad. We're talking about the weekly top three, and now we are jumping back into it uh, regarding number two, which is with two weeks remaining, there are some races, a handful of them, that could decide some interesting things coming up into the next uh, legislative session. Brad, dive in. Well, I think I think James Brooks's article, uh, again, over the weekend, titled These 14 Races Could Decide Who Controls the Alaska Legislature for the Next Two Years, I think that's an excellent article uh, identifying sort of the key races around uh, around who controls the Senate and who controls the House. Uh, in the Senate, James focuses primarily on what's now the Myers-Sanford race, was up until a couple of days ago the Myers-Sanford Eads race uh, up uh, in North Pole in the, in the Fairbanks area. Uh, Evan Eads, who was r- running as an independent, and who was uh, who was running fairly strongly as an independent, uh, withdrew. Uh, can't take his name off the ballot because we're past that date. But 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 has thrown his support publicly through his support to Marna Sanford and said he's going to campaign with Marna, which which changes some of the dynamics of that race. But um, James in his article identifies that as a key race that could swing the Senate uh, one way or the other. When you look at the breakdowns. You've got enough moderate Republicans, or, or not moderate, you've got enough uh, fiscally unconservative Republicans that could align uh, with the Democrats and have a uh, bipartisan majority uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, uh, the Myers race sort of uh, is key to, to keeping the Republicans together and keeping a, a more conservative, uh, more fiscally conservative Republican majority um, in the Senate. And I, and I, yeah, I, that race is undecided. I mean, that race is going to go down uh, to the wire in terms of the activity and in terms of in terms of, of people. So people in that district uh, uh, very much need to vote. And they very much need to pay attention to it. I, I think that uh, James overlooks one other race that has that potential. It's the uh, Madden Stevens race uh, down in the in the in the Kenai, Lower Kenai, uh, and the and the uh, uh, Kodiak. Uh, Prince William Sound uh, area that that district. Uh, when you look at the primary uh, 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 Senator Stevens defeated uh, Cox, uh, John Cox uh, in the right. primary and and won and won that race. But Madden, but Greg Madden picked up more votes uh, in his primary when he where he was unopposed uh, than uh, than Stevens did in his race. So if you take the Cox vote. Combine it with the Madden vote. Uh, Stevens is in is in real trouble down in that race, and I think that that race has sort of been running under the radar uh, in terms of in terms of awareness of what that could mean. Greg is an AIP, uh, Alaska Independence Party, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to a Republican, so maybe that's contributing to it running under the under the radar. But but that I think that and the Myers race are the two important races in the Senate. I think I think uh, James does a pretty good job on the House side, House House side, outlining the key races on the House side, and and when you total when you look at these races all total them up, just like on the Senate, uh, the the Madden race and the and the uh, Myers race would, could swing the Senate between a fiscally conservative Republican, more fiscally conservative Republican majority, or a bipartisan majority. Uh, the races on the House side could swing the House between. Uh, a more fiscally conservative Republican majority, or a continuation uh, of the bi- bipartisan majority. There's there's also another issue that James doesn't pick up on, but that I've been when I've been doing these 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 looks and these vote counts, uh, I've been paying attention to, and that is, are we going to have 16 in the legislature who will back up the governor's vetoes? Right, right. Um, and I think that's that's as that's as important an issue. Uh, as uh, as you know, who controls the Senate or the House? Because if we're if we're going to have a come to Jesus session, the governor is going to have to be actively involved in saying, "I'm not going to allow spending above this level," uh, as he tried to do in 2019, but essentially got rebuffed. Uh, the the governor is going to have to step up and do that. But but for him to do that, there's going to have to be 16 who will back who will back him up. Um, and when I run these vote totals, we're not I'm not sure we have 16 yet. 
uh, a lot of these races that are still up in the air um, uh, will determine whether or not we get to 16. I get to about 14, 12 or 14, and I stall out in terms of absolute certainty, locked in, uh, walked in, locked in wins. So um, people need to focus. People need to focus in their districts, uh, even if it's even if it doesn't look like it's a highly competitive district. You, if you're if you're fiscally conservative, you need to be looking at and voting for the fiscally conservative candidate, because we're going to need every last one of them. Uh, not only to organize the Senate, not only to organize the House, but to have 16 to back up the governor when we have the come to Jesus moment. Where do you start stalling out, if you don't mind me asking? What are the what are the races where you're looking at this and going, you're just not sure? Uh, I mean, these are the questions we should be asking these candidates. If candidates are, are not declared or you're unsure of them, who are they so we can ask these questions? Well, a good example is, uh, is, is Lance Pruitt. I don't... Lance Pruitt was one of those that, that you couldn't count on in 2019 uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to vote with the governor's uh, uh, cuts. Sarah Rasmussen is another one who in 2019 you couldn't count on to, to, to vote the cuts. So when people say, well, well, we'll have a Republican majority if those people win, uh, and that'll be great, and, and you know, everything will be fine and dandy, and, and we'll, we'll walk down the road and be able to cut the budget deeply and, and, and get some sort of fiscal sanity. I, we saw in 2019 that not all Republicans are, are on that road. So you've got to have, you've got to have people like uh, Sarah Vance over Kelly Cooper. You've got to have Sarah Vance, who's, who's going to be one of the 16, come hell or high water. You've got to have Sarah Vance there. You can't afford... You can't afford to, to think, oh, well, if we don't get Sarah, we get somebody else. You've got to have those rock-ribbed uh, fiscal conservatives uh, with you in order, to be able to, uh, in order to be able to hold that. I think David Nelson is another one uh, running for the old Gabby Ledoux seat against Lynn Franks. Uh, I think he would be a rock-ribbed uh, 16. But you, you've, got to, you've got to have those people. Kevin McKinley up against Adam Wool, Mike right. Kronk against Judy Henlicka. You've got to have you've got to have people who are going to be rock ribbed Republicans, uh, rock rock ribbed fiscal conservatives to to have that sixteen. This whole thing with Evan Eads uh, just kind of flies in the face of everything that he said during the campaign. He wanted to be this independent candidate. He had all these big ideas, and yet he embraces the the statist. Uh, on this, I mean, this guy's supposedly a libertarian. This is the this is the point on it, uh, and yet he embraces the status, the big state person. And then John Coggill had the audacity to say, "Well, I'm not endorsing anybody on this race. Like, I'm going to go pout in the corner because nobody liked me." Uh, I mean, really, it, it, it's really how it came off of uh, on this. Instead of, I was a man about it, and I'm endorsing the candidate for my party. He just basically says, no, I'm just going to sit back here and let you guys all play because nobody listened to me, and so poo-poo pitiful me. Well, it's even worse. I mean, he said it's Marna's race to win, or it's Marna's race right, to lose. That, right, right. That, that, that Marna's got the advantage. So, I mean, it, to the extent you read between the lines, John was essentially urging people on to Marna. Yeah, I, exactly. It, 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 the thing with Evan, Evan was, a, was sort of a one-issue candidate, right? It was uh, Mac. Uh, maximum recovery of, uh, of wealth from from resources, and that translates uh, sort of translates into yes on Proposition One, um, and Evan uh, made that sort of the central piece of his campaign. Rob has has not endorsed that. Rob said he's a no on one, uh, and he's got reasons for that. Uh, Marna uh, has said she's a yes on one, and so. Uh, given given how Evan had pitched that campaign, if he was going to make a choice, uh, going to the going to the other candidate that had yes on one makes makes uh, makes some sense. But but doing it this late, uh, doing it two weeks before, makes me wonder. I mean, no one had said uh, that I had seen, and no poll that I had seen said Evan was out of it, um, and and Evan was still in the mix. I mean, it, it, it was it's a very very complex and moving moving parts uh equation up there um and uh and and evan was still in the mix uh and now you know now he's starting to support tomorrow so we'll see rob rob's one of these candidates he's sort of like the ron gillum right i mean we've right. talked about this before rob just keeps putting one foot in front of the other one foot in front of the other one foot in front of the other uh he did that with john he was hugely underfunded john had all sorts of money 
that he didn't use because he thought he was going to have to run against Marna. Uh, and Rob just kept plodding along. And I and you know I I've not seen polling that 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 clearly indicates who's going to win up there. But Rob just keeps plodding along. And as long as people will support him, and sort of forget whatever John says, as long as people will support Rob as the fiscally the more fiscally conservative candidate. Uh, I think I think he's he's still, still got a chance up there, right? I mean, the district is split, but historically, if you look at the split, they've really had to work it hard to be able to come come anywhere close to it. So, uh, again, I think you're right. I think it was the Coghill's last finger in the eye to say, well, you know, or maybe maybe we're all underthinking this. Maybe it was his way of of stimulating people to get out there and vote. I don't know, but I mean, I just the, the whole tone of it was. I'm going to pout because you didn't pick me kind of thing. And uh, yeah. go ahead. North North Pole decides it. I mean, North Pole, you know that Greyer Hopkins district, part of the district, is going to go for Marta. So North Pole decides it. Um, and, and frankly, with Evan out of the race, it may make it easier for Rob to pick up North Pole because Evan was concentrating on North Pole. But the people in North Pole, people listening to this program in North Pole, you need to be, you need to be active. You need to be not only voting for Rob, but telling your friends why you're voting for Rob, uh, and uh, and and urging uh, urging everybody in your community uh, uh, to support Rob because that's that's where it's going to be decided. Rob either comes out of North Pole strong uh, and overcomes what uh, what's going to happen over in Grier's part of the district, or uh, if North Pole doesn't come out strong. Uh, there's going to Rob's going to have problems. Number three, the coming fiscal battle between local governments and the state. Uh, this is going to be the war to end all wars. This is really where the rubber is going to meet the road. It is. There was an article in Alaska News Source, the old KTU uh, KT uh, Channel Two uh, website. Uh, the uh, the title on it was Anchorage Matsu Assemblies Want Full School Debt Funding Bond Debt Funding. I sort of snorted out my coffee when I read Matsu Assembly. Uh, wants school uh, full school bond debt funding. I know why Matt Sue wants that, but but you have to understand that adding back in school debt funding, full statutory school debt funding, uh, uh, according to uh, uh, Ledge Finance in their in their presentation to House Fi- uh, House Finance, uh, adds about 170 million dollars. By the time you take all of the local stuff that was cut and add it back into the budget, that's 170 million dollars additional spending over what we actually spent last year. You're going in the wrong direction. You're adding spending instead of subtracting spending. So as these local governments, and, and in particular Matt Sue, as these local governments say, oh, wait, you know, you, you can't cut us. We need, we need our money. Um, that's, just, that's just putting the PFD uh, at more people or putting the, the need for increased taxes, raising the increased uh, need for, for state taxes. I understand why the localities want it. They don't want to burden their taxpayers. But 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 there's no free lunch here. You're just shifting the burden to to, to statewide taxpayers uh, in terms of PFD cuts or in terms of uh, of increased state taxes. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Less than a minute here, Brad. Final thoughts as we let you go. This election is important. I mean, I, we say that about every election, but this election is critically important. Uh, we don't have. It, it, it's not clear we have 16. And I think that's probably the most important thing to have coming out of this election cycle. So every vote uh, that you can for a fiscal conservative, a rock rib fiscal conservative, is important. Every election that has a that that has some question, uh, the Sarah Vance Kelly Cooper race is a good example. That has that has a question whether you've got a rock, you're going to have a rock rib conservative come out of that. It's important to get in that race, to vote, to donate, to, to be active in that race, to uh, push it across the line. Don't be weary and well-doing, I think is what Brad is saying. Don't let – don't the finish line's in sight. Don't stop before we cross it. That's where we need to be. I appreciate you coming in, Brad. Thanks for joining us. As always, it's great to hear from you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right, thanks for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.